Hey everyone, welcome back to the Supply Change Podcast. This is part two of our interview with astronaut Charlie Duke. Charlie, thanks for rejoining us after a short lunch break. Delighted to be with you. Thank you very much. We're going to be going through a little bit more of a supply chain focused conversation. We're going to be talking about the supply chain of the Apollo program, what it took to get a man on the moon, because there were a lot of different parts that went into play, a lot of different teams that were working together to uh, to make this project happen. Well, let's start here. So I was doing research on the Apollo projects, and I was really astounded because you were able to accomplish 18 missions over the course of 11 years. And so I, I imagine there was a ton of preparation, a lot of training, engineering, a lot of things that went into each mission. So how do you think that NASA was able to accomplish that? Well, I think uh, uh, NASA got organized correctly mm -hmm. in the very beginning. It was a huge undertaking from the very beginning of spaceflight with Mercury and Gemini. And I think they understood that one center of activity could not handle the whole mission. So NASA organized itself according to major divisions of responsibility. For instance, Goddard Space Flight Center up in Maryland became the central organizer for the communications networks, uh, the satellites, and for the communication between spacecraft and the Earth. Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama became responsible for the rocket. They, their responsibility was develop the rockets that will get us into space. Kennedy Space Center in Florida was designated as the launch center for all the rockets where they would be assembled and where they would be tested and then launched. It was then the Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston, Texas was the home of the astronaut. And it was to prepare the crew and to prepare the mission control and to prepare the, the suits and the responsibility of the suits and the lunar modules and the command modules and Apollo and, and all of those kind of uh, spacecraft related to the man side of it. Lewis Space Center, it was then the Lewis Space Flight Center up in uh, Ohio. It was more of a, a technical group. And uh, then there were other satellite centers that had various responsibilities. During Apollo, they, d they opened the lunar I forgot what they call it. it, was in Flagstaff, Arizona, but it was a U.S. Geological Survey Center where they would be responsible for doing the maps and doing the geology, mm -hmm. coordinating all the geology for NASA. Then under them, under all of these others were the contractors. You know, if you're going to build a spacecraft, you report to Houston. Right. Okay, if you're going to build a rocket, you report to Marshall, and then for the check test and check out, you, you sent your teams to Kennedy Space Center. So everybody had their responsibility and the conductor of the orchestra, if you will, was NASA headquarters in Washington. They had a team of experts, not only managers that were not necessarily technical, but they had the technical expertise also. Apollo was announced the first time in June of 1961 where Kennedy said, we're going to go to the moon. Right. It was a year later at Rice University where he made that famous speech about, we're going to go to the moon. Yeah. We're going to go to the moon. Not because it's easy, but because it's, it's hard. hard. Right. That sort of brought the country together and said, we're going to get behind this. And we realized that we were in a race with the Russian and success in this program was going to elevate the American technological exposure to the tops of the world. Mm -hmm. I think we felt like we were lagging behind the Russians at that point. But when Kennedy made that announcement in June of 1961, he committed the U.S. to landing on the moon in eight years, and six months. What a monumental task yeah. that was going to be. And how do you get to the moon? Nobody really knew at that time. Right. But NASA was organized in such a way that the general overland, overall plan and timeline was formulated from the input of, uh, of the contractors who were then selected right after that. Marshall Space Flight Center and Bernard Von Braun had a lot to do with the, how are we gonna do it? Mm -hmm. 
and it was decided that we were going to launch everything on one big rocket and uh, orbit the moon and then the rendezvous recovery we would separate land come back and then rendezvous and then come home that was all decided there were a lot of different ways you could do it but that, that was decided the overall plan if you will and timeline was developed before i got there mm -hmm. apollo had been 61 uh, i got there in 66 so all the contractors were involved 400,000 people were employed at that time. Wow. And the coordination had been good. The Apollo program manager was in Washington, and he organized this. And they had a name for it in that time, a management system. Mm -hmm. I, I forgot what it's called now, but it was a, it was a flow chart, you know. Yeah. And you did this flow chart management, and you just this has got to happen and this right. that will affect this and this has got to go. So the supply chain was, we got to have this part by that time. Yeah. And we had to even design the spacecraft. You know, what's it going to look like? How many people? Uh, is it going to be a command module, a lander? Is it going to be, you know, all those decisions had to be made. It turned out, that even in spite of some of the problems, the flow charts all came together mm -hmm. and we were able to uh, meet the goal with six months to spare. Yeah, that's one of the things that I find so fascinating is a lot of talk revolves around the the technical advancements that happened to make the Apollo project work. But there's this other side of just project management, the way that they manage the project with so many different independently operating branches that at some point had to unify into one, you know, one headquarters, which was at NASA. And so I think that there was, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about the, the technical advancements that came out or the technological advancements that came out, but just revolutionizing project management at that large of a scale, I think is a really incredible feat that they were able to accomplish. I think American industry had a lot of experience with big projects like mm -hmm. that. World War II, you go back and look at from zero almost airplane production yes. to what they did over four years. You know, so many battleships, mm -hmm. so many aircraft carriers, thousands of airplanes, right. that Bendix in North America and all of them, General Motors, you know, well, we were making cars, now we're going to make tanks. Right. To be able to harness this ingenuity of the U.S. industrial base and the expertise of that to get them all pointed towards Apollo. Probably 400,000 people employed at the mm -hmm. peak of the program. As I said earlier in the podcast, that uh, everybody that I met, we used to go around and motivate, have these motivational yeah. visits to these various plants. And a lot of people, if not all, would, I said, what do you do? I'm sending a man to the moon. Yeah. That was their job. Mm -hmm. You know, they might be sweeping the floor, but they might be the chief engineer, but it's, I'm sending the man to the moon. And so it was a tremendous opportunity for us astronauts to uh, to go around and be the cheerleader mm -hmm. of the team, if you will. We got to know a lot of the people involved. I remember going to uh, the suit manufacturer. It was International Latex, L-I-L-C. Mm -hmm. And they'd never made a face suit before. And we went up there, and I mean, the design, to me, the design was fantastic. They were all custom made. Mm -hmm. You know, they I'll take a medium or I'll take a large or whatever. They were all specially built for the crew. You didn't have to motivate these people. That seamstress that was sewing that zipper yeah. into that suit knew the importance of that, that she did her job correctly. Mm -hmm. So the motivation behind the team was self-imposed, if you will. They all realized the importance to this mission. And to the details of the supply chain, all the widgets showed up on schedule and all of the parts showed up on schedule. And the only thing uh, was falling behind, we had a couple of programs, the uh, asset engine for the lunar module. They could not quite get it qualified, the manufacturer. And so the Apollo spacecraft program director in uh, Houston, George Lowe, made a decision to form this Tiger team to go look at this manufacturer and uh, decide whether we going to, what will we do but to get this thing qualified? Because the asset engine is really a major part of, yeah. uh, 
of the lunar module, it's got to get you off the moon reliably. I was on that team from the astronaut office, and we ran around. We spent six months visiting the manufacturer and then the, the other rocket manufacturers around the country, and we focused in on, I guess it was Aerojet in California. They were making a lot of the rocket engines on the other systems, mm -hmm. like the F-1 engines and the command module engines. So we looked at them, and, and they took just took the basic design and said, well, this is the problem, the injectors aren't drilled right or something. Mm -hmm. So they put in a new design, and in six months, we were convinced that they were going to be the, the savior. Yeah. And so we went to uh, Lowe and uh, presented our case, and he said, okay, do it. And the one thing that was so important I thought about Apollo was when the manager says, fix it. Man, tomorrow they were working on it. Yeah. Fix it. You know, we had a, a fire in uh, January 1967 on Apollo 1 that killed a crew in the space. They were in the spacecraft going through a test and they caught fire and they were all asphyxiated and uh, killed. And so now we're dead in the water and, you know, less than two years to go. Yeah. A little less than three years to go. We got to fix this. So it was, a, it took 18 months dedicated effort and in 18 months they redesigned the hatch and redesigned this that and the other and took out the velcro and all that which was flammable developed new non-flammable material and new wiring and all those things made we had lost they were so busy in my view they had lost quality control hmm. of the manufacturing process yeah but that shook everybody so tremendously that we went back to a very, very focused quality control mm -hmm. uh, effort. So we rejected a lot of parts, right? electronic parts, and it's not redid. And the supply chain came came to life on an accelerated basis. So we flew Apollo 7 in uh, October of 1968. So now we got two years and basically a year and two months mm -hmm. to get to the moon. Right. So Apollo 7 was successful. I think intelligence or something said, hey, the Russians are mounting a attempt to go to the moon with people. And so they changed Apollo 8 from an Earth orbit checkout second flight to sit it on top of the Saturn V hmm. and send it with no backup. Hmm. First time the Saturn V had people on top of it, only the second time we flew the command module. And we're sending this vehicle to the moon, and if it breaks, they're dead. Mm -hmm. The motivation was there. The crew says, we're ready to go. My neighbor was on that crew, and there was so anybody so focused on this. And so anyway, the, the system came together and started accelerating and for the recovery. After Apollo 8 was so successful, uh, I guess the flight started looking at well, we, let's check out the lunar module in Earth orbit, Apollo 9. Let's take the lunar module to the moon on Apollo 10. Right. And let's land on Apollo 11. And that's what happened. Mm -hmm. The team brought it all together, and we stayed right on schedule, accelerated missions until we hit that goal. Shortly thereafter, Apollo changed its focus from just flying to the moon and landing on the moon to let's do some science. Right. So I got the privilege of working on a mission, as I said earlier, that was one of the major science missions of Apollo. And the last three missions, 15, 16, and 17, were three days on the moon, exploration of the lunar surface. All that while the uh, supply chain kept up, there was never any shortages. Everything just showed up. You had some delays in test and check out because this widget broke or that broke, mm -hmm. but we had su supplies and we changed them out, and got pieces that worked. And so Apollo was tested and tested and tested in activation and checkout, mostly as a stack at Kennedy Space Center. And we did thermal tests down there. We got in the spacecraft and pressurized, and we did vacuum tests, and we did thermal tests, and we did all this, and the crew's in there doing these tests. So you got a lot of experience in the mm -hmm. space. You got a lot of confidence uh, in the spacecraft. And so the way it was done was so motivational to me yeah. that I knew when I got on this thing, it was 99% it was going to work. That was probably the probability of success. So 
we were ready to launch. Every crew was ready to launch, whether it was two months training or in our case, two years. So uh, supply chain, I think focus to detail, focused on detail so that everything makes it to Kennedy Space Center and roll it out and launch. We never missed a beat. Yeah, that's spectacular. I think I want to unpack one of the things you said that, you know, you had about a nine, you said, what, 99% probability that things were going to, that were going to go right. Yeah. And I think one of the things that I've noticed in my time working in the supply chain is that if you're not careful, you try to achieve that 100% chance of success number and you get so obsessed with that that you fall into analysis paralysis you know you try to make sure you account for every variable you try to make things perfect before you get them out there i mean obviously with the stakes of the apollo project and understanding the consequences of something did wrong there was still an amount of acceptable risk you had to assume exactly. you know doing a project like that exactly the big joke was going around it was 50,000 parts in this machine all made by the lowest bidder you know <laughs> but uh it wasn't cheap the bids came in and they got picked because they were reasonable mm -hmm. the contract grew and the scope grew and so they added on but everybody uh quality work I was really impressed with when I got in a, our, our spacecraft. I mean, it was like, like you were putting on an old glove or an old, yeah. you know, you felt so comfortable yeah. in it and you trusted it because you knew the dedication of those people that had made right. it and the dedication of those people that had checked it out and the dedication of the reliability. And they did reliability assessments on every part. You know, this thing's going to last. It's going to be 99.9 .9 or whatever it was, success. So if it didn't check out, they removed that part and stuck another one in that was tested. Even with the, uh, the fire at Kennedy, everybody was standing in line to go. You know, nobody was wringing their hands. Oh, yeah. God, what if this thing blows up? If you had that attitude, you wouldn't go. You'd never volunteer. Right. So you were willing to test, take that risk. Even after Apollo 15, we proved that we could recover a spacecraft that was severely, severely damaged mm -hmm. and still recover the crew. Now, if that accident happened right after they left the moon, they wouldn't have made it because it was the only supply of oxygen, the only spacecraft that would re-enter. And once you lose the oxygen in Apollo, you lose your electrical power because mm. you made electricity by fuel cells combining right. hydrogen and right. that. So you lose the oxygen or hydrogen, you're dead in the water. So we wouldn't have made it, but we made it because of, if you're going to have a failure, going to the moon is the place to have it because you still have a backup. So besides landing on the moon, I think when, when we talk about the Apollo project, it's become synonymous with landing on the moon, exploring the moon. Besides that, what do you think the lasting legacy of the Apollo project would be? Well, some people say it's, it's the greatest program that mankind's ever done. The inspiration that Apollo gave to our country, how it steered people to get involved in science and engineering, that began to fade after Apollo, but now it's being revived through science, technology, engineering, math, mm -hmm. uh, the STEM program. Right. It's important that we develop these engineers and scientists. The new technologies that were developed in materials, new materials, right. the miniaturization of electronics and the shielding of electronics, electromagnetic interferences could be a major problem. Right. So all of those technologies and scientific approaches didn't get major play, but now you see how important that was to the development of the electronics industry and mm -hmm. computers. Our Apollo computer on board had 35,000 word memory and <laughs> it were two bits per word. So it was like 70,000 bits. Wow. So I round that off to 80,000 because I can do the math better. Sure. And let's say we had 80,000, 80K memory in Apollo computer. Yeah. And in the Apollo computer, we had a, the lunar module one, we had three descent program. We had an inertial measurement line program. We had two rendezvous programs, and all in 80K. And now my cell phone, I've <laughs> got, a, I think, a 64 gig or whatever it is. Right. But you divide 80,000 into 
80K into that, and it's 800,000 times of memory yeah. in my back pocket right. than what we had in Apollo. And yet it worked. Everybody yeah. had confidence in the systems. Quality control was developed. I think that's more important in management. I mean, in technical areas is have a good quality control. Right. That you're making a piece that you can re be repetitive. Right. You're sure it's going to work. NASA developed a, a great quality control, and the manufacturers, contractors did also. So when I strapped into that Saturn that command module on that Saturn V, it was 99% chance that it's going to work. Yeah. You knew there was a possibility you weren't going to make it, but if that worried you, you wouldn't go. Right. But you were willing to take the risk. And as a test pilot, I'd taken risk. As a fighter pilot, I'd taken risk. I mean, that's just the, just the nature of the astronaut program yeah and the people that are involved in it and you had confidence in mission control there's a documentary out called mission control the unsung heroes of apollo how many times they saved the day they saved our landing we had a problem they were so well trained and nasa had so much background data they could look at the information we were sending back from the moon some engineer somewhere Hey, that looks familiar. And he went back to a test. Yeah. Or she went back to a test that had done in Tullahoma, Tennessee at Arnold Air Force Station, and where they cut the feed wire, the feedback to, from the engine sensors to the computer. And so when they lit the engine, they get a circular nozzle. The pressure equalizes as it comes out the nozzle. Right. And the, the engine went poof, set it up. And you, then you steered it with the reaction control system. So that was our backup. So, so they, they figured that out. And they said, okay, you got to go for landing. Took them six hours to do that. But we got to go for landing. And I mean, from a crew standpoint, when they said, no, sir, we weren't going to land in the next hour, two years I'd trained. Yeah. Come all that way. And there's my landing site eight miles beneath me. And they're saying, come home. Mm. That would have been a very disappointing day oh man to say the least but anyway they fixed it so anyway mission control had a great role in the success of apollo the operational success and then the manufacturers and the quality control team and all of those managers had a motivation and they worked tirelessly to do that and they took a lot of risk space flight's not risk-free right so you gotta you gotta commit it to it. you gotta commit these guys to a vehicle that's not 100%, but reliable enough that you're willing to commit this vehicle to launch. Mm -hmm. I think that's so important as well. You mentioned uh, the Kennedy speech that has really gone down in history as one of the most important speeches for, obviously, not just for NASA, but just for the improvement of technology and engineering and all the things that you mentioned. And I think it's so important to have a leader that you can get behind and somebody who's willing to say, we're going to go do this. We don't know how we're going to do it yet. Exactly, yeah. But someone who has the, you know, the vision to say, I believe in my people to to be able to say we're going to go do this and I trust that they're going to figure out the how of how to do it. And so and, well, that was like that. NASA's coming back to that now. They for a while there they got a little risk averse. Well, we got to make it 100%. Well, you can't make it 100%. Yeah. Uh, you got a lot. We had two shuttles explode or break up and kill the crew and uh, but nasa kept pressing on they saw the benefit of the mission that they were designated to do so all of the managers that i met were very dedicated individuals they made a lot of decisions that were uh, critical decisions and it could have resulted in the loss of a crew or we were all personal friends, mm -hmm. and yet we backed management, and we were with them, and we, yeah, we were going to take the risk. If you didn't want to take the risk, uh, you didn't go. Yeah. You didn't volunteer. Yeah. And uh, several guys decided, that's it for me. I would have flown some more, but the Apollo was over. Yeah. Then I went to work on Space Shuttle, and it was still 10 years into the future, and it was just plodding along, you know. I said, man, I mean, we made decisions in hours in Apollo, and yeah. now, well, we'll have a meeting next month, you know, and uh, and so I said, that's it. I was frustrated, you know, a lot of the Apollo moonwalkers, you know, 
in their 30s, climb to the ladders at the top of the ladder, and now what are you going to do? Right. So it was a challenge getting getting focused again. Yeah, and I think one of the things you mentioned and that I've certainly seen in my life is that innovation is always on that border. There's always risk in innovation. There's like you're you're right on the edge, and that's something that you experienced as a as a fighter pilot. You know, innovation's right there on the edge. You got to push it just that little bit, and so it's never going to be risk averse. There's always going to be inherent risk in finding those limits, and I think it's it's inspiring not only to, you know, uh, to the people who are part of the project, but to a nation and really to the world. I think that's one of the lasting legacies of the Apollo Project is it created a sense of unity not just for the United States, but for the for the world, for mankind to know we can go accomplish this and we can go do this again. It's elevated the standard of living in the third world technology has mm -hmm. and uh, you look at the cell towers and telephones every little village has got a cell phone and uh, yeah. space technology for agricultural production and all of the things that elevate the standard of living in the third world so technology has been a tremendous help in raising the standard of living of the third world nation still got a long way to go mm -hmm. but it's better than it was in the earlier after world war ii mm -hmm. so I don't know if you have an estimate on this, but I'm curious. Do you know how much it cost to build that initial computer that was used for the uh, the Apollo 11 or, or any of the Apollo missions? Uh, no, I know who did it, but I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember the size of the contract. I think Raytheon built the computer, and uh, the software was done by engineers at at MIT. Okay, there was probably a room full of men and women writing the software. Yeah. It's amazing how successful all that was. But several million dollars probably was the size Man. of the contract. Yeah. That's incredible. You think about, you know, you're talking about your phone in your pocket, how that you can go to the store and pick one up for two, $300. And just uh, to be able to take that back in time would have blown, <laughs> blown people's minds a little bit. And just the technology of, uh, for instance, a lunar rover. Down here it weighed like 500 pounds. Not quite. Yeah, 500 pounds. Up there it was 80 pounds. But that 80 pounds would carry two fully loaded, two astronauts yeah. weighed 65 pounds each and uh, 50, 60 pounds of moon rock. Mm -hmm. Here's a vehicle that was, and all the equipment that was on it, and this vehicle was opposite of what a U.S. car, you know, you get a car, it weighs 3,000 pounds, right. maybe carry 500, you know, yeah. for people in luggage. But this is just the reverse. It, it was the smallest weight. And yet it carried all this stuff and was so reliable. It revolutionized lunar exploration. And that was developed in about less than a year. Wow. The, That's incredible. It had to be engineered so ingeniously because the spot to put the lunar module was five feet by five feet. And the car was five feet by ten feet. <laughs> so how do you make it fit? Well, they broke the chassis up into three pieces. The front chassis patched to the middle and the wheels came in like landing gear and it folded over on the center chassis and the rear wheels did the same now it's five by five so they just bolted it to the spacecraft to deploy it we had to pull some pins and then john got on his side and i got on my side and we just started pulling these pulleys and what we were doing was turning the jack screw that was jacking the thing out like this and when it got to 45 degrees all the pins got pulled and it just flopped open wow and it was the most amazing i don't know whether you remember back when my when i was a kid rue goldberg it was this uh, rue goldberg machine yeah, yeah. Machi rue goldberg machine but it worked and uh and we just made sure it was latched together and picked it up you could pick up your car on the moon turned it around so john jumped in turned on the power and off he went wow that's, uh, yeah, there's just so many, I, I can only imagine there's so many of those types of stories where you have all these people who put in thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of hours, you know, combined yeah. just for that one little piece, you know, that one little piece that maybe gets some screen time on the cameras. Maybe there's things that never get screen time on the cameras. You know, we talked a little bit in our, in our prior episode about the sensationalized Hollywood type of approach from the movie side. And... You think about all the things, the glamorous things, right? You know, they, they 
focus on the rover and they focus on the you know the shuttle and they focus on the astronauts and the people at Capcom and but there's all these hundreds of thousands of hours taking place for all the things that don't get seen and those people are equally as committed to their jobs as the people who understand that they're going to get a little bit of that press when they come back yeah yeah that's true it was it was a great program to work on i was so proud and honored to have been a part of it i think it's had a, a big influence on our nation that it elevated us to the leading technological nation in the world to maintain that position we need to work hard people look to the u.s to solve so many problems and i see our technological base expanding and motivated. Like we said earlier, the civilian side of space technology. You know, NASA never made a thing. We all contracted out. Mm-hmm. They put out a request for a proposal. Uh, we need a lunar module that needs to do this, 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 and this. And they just sent it out. Said, if you think you can build this, bid on it. Yeah. And we get these bids back. What I see now with the civilian space side, if you will, they came to NASA and said, hey, this is what we got. You want to buy it? <laughs> and so NASA put some of it to the test, and they analyzed it. And they said, yeah, we'll buy that, and we'll buy this one. And so we got SpaceX, and they got Blue Origin, they got several others. They're the civilian side of space now, all on their design. But NASA's, it's they were so good that NASA decided to buy it, and uh, now we're launching people on SpaceX to the space station, and they're taking supplies up. I hear things in the background about, well, we're going to have Earth space to risen, but sooner or later, we're going to have passengers going to the moon, I think. Yeah. At least to orbit the moon and see. It's the ingenuity and the uh, imagination of companies like Aptricity and, and others that are developing things now that are never dreamed of when I was your age. That's just the way engineering and human imagination go. I do a lot of autographing for kids, and, mm-hmm. and one of the things I put on it is that, to Sam, always dream big. Yeah. And, and have that dream of, hey, I can do this, or I can do that. Why don't we do it this way? Whatever, and people fail, but they keep going, and, uh, and succeed too. So. Yeah. Well, I can't really think of a better way to close the podcast than that. I want to thank you, Charlie, for taking the time to uh, talk with us today. Charlie, it really has been a pleasure. Like I said, I've, I've been very blessed to have heard you speak and also have had conversations like this with you. So I really appreciate you coming out and uh, wish you the best of travels wherever you go. Thank you. I'm, I'm delighted to be associated with Electricity. And thank you so much, Christian, for having me on. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys for tuning in. We will have this episode live on YouTube as well. And we will catch you guys next time. <laughs>